and I'm here to talk about GraphQL. And so if you're like me and you didn't know what GraphQL was, maybe you were thinking it's something like that, but it's not. Or maybe you were thinking it's a graphing library or something, but it, that's not it either. So what is GraphQL? Well, GraphQL, well, before we actually talk about GraphQL, let's bring REST into the story. So REST is what we're familiar with, but there are an increasing number of people who are switching from REST to GraphQL. And that's why you should care about GraphQL. Now, why are people doing that? Why are they switching? That's the question. So, uh, let's consider a not too uncommon situation for this. So let's say that you're Facebook and you want to display a list of posts for each user. And you also want to show uh, the likes for each of those posts by each user. And you also want to show the comments for each uh, post for that user. So you would write your REST endpoint and then you would get this JSON object back. But then you'd say, hey, on my phone, I noticed that I don't really want to show likes and comments actually because it's going to take up too much screen space. So you write another. Um, REST endpoint, and actually you might have to do two, one for iOS and one for Android. So then you would have to end up with a bunch more uh, J uh, JSON objects. And then if you have your data in different data sources, well then you have to write more endpoints because some data might be in MySQL database and the other might be in a Redis store. And so then you have to end up with a whole bunch of JSON objects. And now like, what do you do? And as you can see, as your app gets more complex, like things start to get a little bit uh, kind of spirally out of control. So what Facebook did was that in 2012, they decided to internally develop GraphQL. And then they publicly released it in 2015. And since then, it's been adopted by a whole bunch of different companies and uh, startups and things like that. So what is GraphQL? GraphQL is a query language for APIs. And what that means is that it allows you to handle complex queries and it gives you the data output that you want exactly. And so instead of having multiple dumb endpoints, you would have one smart endpoint that handles it all. So a simple representation of REST uh, is that you, if you want to go get sushi or get a haircut or go get some eggs, then you would go to each of those endpoints and get that done. Whereas if you were to use GraphQL as your middleman, then you would have GraphQL handle the sushi and the haircut and the groceries, whatever you wanted. And the query would look like this. Query is a keyword. And then stuff would be the field. And then within the stuff, you say, OK, get me the sushi, the haircut, and the groceries. So now this is kind of a silly example. So let's look at a more realistic example. So this is um, posts that you're trying to get. And this post is actually an array. So you can do an array here in this query. And this would give you an array of posts with these fields, title, body, author. And you can nest it. Author could be also an array that where you're calling for specifically name, avatar URL, profile URL within that. You can also use arguments. So you can say, I want a specific post. You can also dynamically use arguments like that. And you can also name your query like that with get my post. So uh, the result of your query would be very similar to the query itself. So it matches up pretty nicely. Now, queries are one part of GraphQL. And there's actually three parts of GraphQL. And uh, this is the second one. It's a resolver. Resolver is what basically tells the query where to go. So it's kind of like the address book for uh, the query. So let's go. It, basically, it's just doing this post.find to, to go get the post that you're looking for. And you can go a little deeper than that. Once you get the post, you can say, OK, well, I want the users, too, as well. And um, you can even create virtual fields right here in your query instead of having to do it on the back end in your database. That comments count is a virtual field. It's not actually in the database, but you can create one for each of your posts. So the third component of GraphQL, besides the queries and the resolvers, is the schemas. Now, schemas are kind of complex, and so it's kind of like too long for this talk. So basically know that the, the big takeaway is that there's three parts, queries, resolvers, and schemas. And you can read more about uh, schemas in the re uh, resources that I have at the end. So what are the pros of GraphQL? Well, the first one is that you can fetch lots of data in one request. So here's an example, uh, very simple, where if you have this request, um, you can get this back. And in classic REST architecture, it would take you two uh, round trips to get this data. You can also only get the data exactly that you need. So for example, if you have this 
uh, endpoint that you're looking for, you can actually get just, uh, if you were doing REST, you would get all the cars, the Tesla cars, whereas opposed to if you wanted just the ones with the Falcon Wing doors, you can use GraphQL to give you that because REST generally gives you the fullest possible request, whereas GraphQL gives you the smallest possible request. And then another benefit of GraphQL is that it actually handles queries, whereas REST does not. For REST to do it, you have to actually use query parameters. Um, GraphQL is, of course, a query language. That's what the QL stands for. So in REST, you would have to do something like this. And this kind of presents some issues where you might have something like you're doing a display option uh, in the height. You want to see it by feet, but you have a filter for ID. And that kind of mixes the view a little bit. Whereas, oh, sorry. Whereas in the GraphQL, you can actually see the, um, that they handles it a little more uh, elegantly if it ever shows up because I've forwarded it um, too soon. And it may not be coming up. But um, I don't know why it's taking that long. There it is. So here you can see that it handles it a little more elegantly than that there at the top. So um, here's another example where you have an include in uh, REST endpoint. And in GraphQL, you can see down there that it handles it a little more defined. And this is another example where you get exactly what you want. When you uh, eager load something, you're, again, loading the fullest possible request a second time or more times, depending on how many times you're, you're including something. Whereas with GraphQL, you get exactly what you want. And then another benefit is that it makes deprecations much easier. This is not something we work with because we don't use, we don't have clients connecting with us. But if we did, uh, REST makes it more difficult because you are having all these fields uh, open, whereas with GraphQL, you're specifying specific fields. So if you deprecate a field, people will know uh, right away. What are the cons of GraphQL? Well, the first one is that it is a learning curve because uh, let's face it, REST is pretty intuitive. When you're doing CRUD operations, all the verbs make pretty simple sense. Uh, whereas with GraphQL, the queries are uh, intuitive, but the resolvers and the schemas, not quite so much. And you have to like read up on it and kind of like get over that learning curve. And then there's setup needed because you also need a GraphQL client as well as a GraphQL server. So you need to set those up. It's not just as simple as writing up some routes. And then uh, third con is that you can't use HTTP, ca uh, HTTP caching, which is helpful to avoid refetching resources, which REST does very well because it, it uses HTTP, but uh, GraphQL only uses fields, so not so much for GraphQL. And similarly, you can't use HTTP file uploads because, again, GraphQL only uses fields, but uh, REST, which we don't actually use this for file uploads uh, here, but SS. From what I hear, it supports file system uploads and URL-based uploads pretty well. Um, so some frequently asked questions. If it doesn't make graphs, then why is it called GraphQL? Well, apparently, the theory is that if you have a business and you're trying to define all the relationships between all your different nodes, uh, all those lines of relationships make up a graph. So that's why it's called GraphQL. I'm happy with Rust. Should I switch to GraphQL? The answer is no. Um, you, if you switched, uh, you, just because others switch doesn't mean that you have to. And if your app is still performant, then you might as well just stick with Rust because there's no, there's no need to switch. But uh, you actually can use both in your app as well. So it's not like one or the other. And then lastly, what if Facebook stops supporting it? And the community around GraphQL is pretty big right now. So if Facebook stops supporting it, it would still continue to grow. OK, so that's uh, some resources here. Clients, this is the official clients. Apollo is a new player, and it's growing um, pretty rapidly. So that's uh, because the, re the relay one is supposedly like using a hammer for something that's really small. Server options as well there. And then if you want to learn more, there's the official docs. This is a tutorial where you can build a chat app. Um, customer chat app using GraphQL and React. And that's another tutorial down there. And then the last thought I just wanted to share is that uh, why would you care? Whether you like it or you don't like it, I think you should at least know what it is. So, Because you, know, you might get asked this in a job interview question or something like that. So, All right, thank you. <laughs>